The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report says there's only a dozen years for global warming to be kept to a maximum of 1.5 degrees Celsius. To have at least a 50-50 chance of staying under that cap, the world must become carbon neutral. That's according to the research. Now, even a half degree increase would leave the world at significant risk of sea levels rising, of drought, of extreme weather conditions uh, and of species extinction. Well, uh, for more on this story, I'm joined now by Miles Allen. He's one of the author's landmark, uh, one of the authors of that landmark report. Mr. Allen, thank you very much for joining us on the programme uh, this morning. Uh, now, this new thank you. Uh, target of 1.5 degrees is at the more ambitious end of the Paris uh, Climate uh, Change Agreement from 2016. Why this revision to 1.5 from potentially 2%, uh, 2 degrees? Well, that decision was made in Paris. They wanted to pursue efforts towards 1.5 degrees. Um, and at the time, we actually had relatively little information, both on what that would mean for, for coral reefs, as you mentioned, or for ecosystems around the world, or for people around the world, forestry, like you're showing now. Um, and we also had little information back then about what it would take to achieve 1.5 degrees. So that's why, as part of the Paris Agreement, I think it was a condition of some countries signing up to the Paris Agreement that they commissioned this report so that we had a detailed view of both what it would take to achieve, to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, and what it would mean if we didn't. Well, we, we, we know roughly what it means uh, if, if we don't, rising sea levels, species extinction. Uh, but with Trump, uh, for example, promising to pull out of the Paris uh, Climate Agreement and other, other countries around the world potentially poised to do the same thing, how realistic do you think it is that we can try and keep global warming below that 1.5 degrees? Well, the good thing about this process is that it is all countries coming together to agree on a, a level playing field, a, get everybody getting on the same sheet as far as the science is concerned. And all countries present, in, including the United States at this meeting, have been very constructive, very rigorous in their analysis of our report and in, their, in going through line by line our summary to make sure it accurately reflected the findings of the report and that that report accurately reflects the current state of scientific knowledge so all countries are on board with the state of the science. Now, some countries, like the United States, are debating amongst themselves how they're going to respond to the threat of climate change. But this report is not about telling countries what to do. It's about laying out the consequences of their decisions, and then politicians can go away and decide how they're going to act on it. Chinese authorities have confirmed what many already suspected. Head of Interpol, and Interpol Meng Hongwei, has been detained by a Chinese government anti-corruption unit. He's now under investigation, though what for is still unclear. Hongwei has sent uh, in his resignation to Interpol with immediate effect. His wife Grace gave a tearful press conference in Lyon. She showed reporters his last text message to her just after his plane landed in China last week. Wait for my call, he said to her, followed by the image of a knife. She spoke with her back to the cameras uh, for fear of being identified. Have a listen. From now on, I have gone from sorrow and fear to the pursuit of truth, justice and responsibility toward history. For the husband whom I deeply love, for my young children, for the people of my motherland, for the sake of all the wives and children whose husbands and fathers I want to no longer disappear. Even though I can't see my husband, we are always connected by our hearts. Well, let's get a little more on this. To do that, I'm joined uh, by our correspondent Stéphane de Vries, who's in Paris for us. Uh, good morning to you, Stéphane. Uh, now, Mr Meng was, uh, was detained by Chinese anti-corruption unit. It's a fairly new agency, and it's rather a powerful one, isn't it? Yes, it is. It, it was uh, actually started in March this year uh, at the uh, China's People's Congress, and it is a, um, a very um, uh, exclusive agency, uh, meaning that it is only accountable to the Chinese National People's Congress. And this means actually it is under direct supervision of the Chinese President Xi Jinping. 
Um, it is one of the measures to fight anti-corruption. Uh, Xi Jinping, when he took power in 2012, said that he was going to fight corruption in his own country. Uh, but the uh, National Committee has uh, many powers uh, which are very secretive, actually. Many officials disappear for months without trial or without even legal counsel. Um, and also it's being used to lock up human rights activists who are a bit too vocal uh, about the Chinese government, according to the Chinese officials, of course. Um, so um, it's being used to put pressure on high officials and to uh, crack down on corruption. But many critics say that this body is actually an instrument for uh, the President Xi Jinping to fight his uh, potential competitors and to, um, well, to, to establish his power even more firmly than it already is. And you touched upon it there. Um, Meng Hongwei, the head of Interpol, is not the only person to have gone uh, missing, is he? Yes, uh, the most um, the, the, the most high-ranking official was Zhang Yongkang. He was the most prominent um, um, competitor of Mr. Xi Jinping. He was also the head of the security services, and he was sentenced to life in 2014. Now, he already also appointed the head of Interpol, who disappeared uh, this week. But he's not the only one. Uh, one of the most um, famous uh, people is the movie star Fan Bingbing. Now, she's very well known in China. In the, in the West, she's known for roles in Iron Man and in X-Men. She disappeared only a couple of months ago and only last week it became clear that she was under charges of tax evasion and she will have to pay a fine of $130 million. And now state uh, officials say that this should serve as a lesson for the country's artists and, and actors. Uh, now even uh, though the Chinese are stepping up uh, their anti-corruption fight, they do so knowing that it will undermine the credibility in international organizations like Interpol. And now more from Brazil, where far-right candidate Jair Bolsonaro has won the first round of the presidential elections. Uh, the controversial social liberal party leader won 46% of the vote. That's 49 million votes, just missing the majority he needed for an outright win. He'll now face a second round of voting against a candidate from the opposite end of the political spectrum, Workers' Party candidate Fernando Haddad. Uh, the result of this first round represents huge political divisions in Brazil. Well, let's get more on this, uh, and to do that, we're joined by journalist Cleusi de Oliveira, who's in Brasilia. Good morning to you, Ms. Oliveira. Nice to, nice to speak to you on the programme this morning. Uh, now, Bolsonaro is obviously a, a controversial candidate. He's done extremely well in this, uh, in this first round. Uh, do you put that down to a clever campaign run by him? Well, it's difficult to say because he, it's certainly been clever. He's weaponized the Internet and the, the kind of memes and social media, but at the same time, he spent the last month without being able to take to the streets to campaign because he was stabbed in early September. So it's it was a confluence of things that have led to this moment. Uh, he, his, uh, the president of his party said that a lot of it was about him being on the ground with the people, holding their hands, you know, being really face to face with them. Uh, do you think that's, uh, there's some truth in that? I do think that there's some truth in that, although obviously that was uh, that was not possible in the past month or so. It's also the case that there's just been so much polarization, and he has taken advantage of that by speaking um, to a lot of Brazilians' fears. There's this somewhat irrational fear that Brazil will succumb to communism and um, be like Venezuela if he doesn't win, and so that that's kind of one of the thing, one of the platforms that he has been campaigning on. You touched on it there, the polarization of the country. Did this first round of election expose the extent to which Brazil is a divided nation at the moment? And how does that, how does that division manifest itself? Oh, there's no doubt about it that there's an extreme polarization right now. Just so you have an idea, the center candidates um, have been absolutely uh, demolished in this first round, even including um, the party PSDB. It hadn't not won a first round in over six elections. This is the first time since then. So, and the candidates that were the, considered the moderates have gotten single digit uh, percentages of votes. Uh, if Bolsonaro, as expected, does uh, become Brazil's next president, what do you think that'll mean uh, outwardly facing for Brazil's place in the world, for, for, you know, for what Brazil represents in, uh, in world politics? I think that'll be very uh, complicated for Brazil because he he certainly represents a hardline um, 
right-wing candidate who has praised the dictatorship in Brazil. So we don't know if that means a return to authoritarian authoritarianism here and how the other countries around the world will respond to any kind of curtailment of democracy. Cleusi de Oliveira, thank you very much, friend. We're going to have to leave it there. Uh, Cleusi de Oliveira in Brasilia.